Uh, so uh, it is Monday, uh, March 23rd. Uh, so we have a lot to talk about to get things started. Uh, uh, for starters, I finally, and I apologize for the delay in doing this, got your uh, exams graded. Uh, all your grades should be updated and should be correct on Canvas now. So if you have any questions about that, uh, yeah. yes. Um, uh, I'm not, you know, obviously I have no way of getting them back to you, but if you have any questions about your grade, I'm happy to go over your exam with you. Uh, this week I will start doing office hours, so I will be hanging out uh, after the lecture uh, for a bit if you have any additional questions. I know I got a couple emails already about that. Uh, also, speaking of emails, um, uh, hopefully the pace of everything after the first hour, obviously, uh, last time uh, went pretty well. Although I am going to extend the breaks, uh, we'll go back to something closer to a 10 minute break. We won't do the full 15 like we did in uh, at school, but uh, we can do a more of a 10 minute break because it is a long period of time. And so a little bit of a break in between uh, could be good for, and beneficial for everybody. So uh, <clears throat> we can expand that a little bit as we move forward. Our goal for today is to um, continue through our discussion of the respiratory system. We are almost done with the anatomy. I know we said we were gonna do most of it last time, and we had done most of it, but we're gonna finish the rest of that today and start talking about some of the physiology. There are activities that you should be doing. Your unit reviews uh, are going to be completed, and uh, if we continue to stay online, I'll set up a Dropbox where you can take pictures of them, return them to the PDFs, and drop them off that way. Uh, but it, what is especially important to work on after what we're going to be talking about today, today, if we were in class, after today's lecture, we would be doing and measuring our own respiratory volumes. Uh, that's going to be the end of today's lecture. Uh, and it fits right into the first activity, really the first two activities of your Physio X exercise seven. Uh, that is due one week from today. Uh, so today's information should help you to be successful for that. Uh, you're going to need to know how to do those calculations, how to, to calculate those values. So that is going to be something that is going to be important. And another thing is we're trying to find different ways to study this. I really want to emphasize uh, taking advantage of the resources that are available for you in the Mastery a &P. Uh, Most, if not all of you, should have access to the Mastery a &P. And so uh, at the end, I do want to spend a little bit of time going over that again to show you some of the great resources that are there. Aside from the Physio X, which obviously is a graded assignment, uh, there's a lot of other stuff in there that is going to be really helpful and useful as well. Oh, I forgot to grab my water. Um, all right, we'll give people one more minute to do that. I'm going to run back downstairs, grab my water. I will be right back. Hold on one moment. All righty, so that is the game plan. Any questions on that before we get started? All right, blank screen means that you totally understand. So let's switch gears back into our anatomy. So um, we left off last time and we were working our way through the anatomy. Uh, we had started with the gross anatomy and worked our way down and finished off with the respiratory membrane, which basically is where the gas exchange is going to take place in the respiratory zone. And uh, again, we talked about how thin it was. Basically, it's two simple squamous epithelial tissues with a little bit of basement membrane in between them. The one little bit of anatomy we didn't talk about is the circulations. If we go back to the cardiovascular system, and I'm gonna cheat now and go back to my drawing board. So give me a second to get this set up.
That's weird. For some reason, I won't allow me to share my uh, iPad like I have in the past. Try this one more time. Well, that's going to be a pain. All right, well, um, shucks. Okay, we moved on. <clears throat> All right, I'll try to cheat and do it here, although it won't be nearly as nice. Um, so if we think of the cardiovascular system, we know we have the heart. And when we talked about our pulmonary circulation, we know that that is basically blood leaving from our uh, right ventricle. To the lungs. And then going back to the left atrium. We know that the blood coming here in our pulmonary arteries. are going to be oxygen poor and CO2 rich. Right. It's the pulmonary uh, circulation is the one that screws it up for everybody else. Our pulmonary arteries are oxygen poor. They go to the lungs where the gas exchange takes place. This gas exchange that takes place, as we talked about on the first day, would be an example of an external. And with that external gas exchange, uh, oxygen comes in to the blood and our CO2 goes out of the blood. So that when we come back in our um, pulmonary veins, the blood is now oxygen rich and CO2 poor. Again, there should be no new information there, All right? Hopefully we're comfortable with that. back up and bring that back up. Okay, perfect. All right, so that is all new stuff. I mean, that is all old stuff. That is stuff that we actually know. That and that, as we said, is the pulmonary circulation. So we have that pulmonary circulation uh, that we know and understand. However, it turns out there is a second uh, circulation of blood associated with the lungs, and that is what we call our bronchial circulation. Oops, no, sorry. Bronchial bron circulation. Our bronchial circulation, if you think about our pulmonary circulation, uh, it, uh, 
if you think about it, our pulmonary circulation is basically about going to the alveoli uh, for gas exchange. Our bronchial circulation, on the other hand, is about providing the oxygen and the nutrients necessary for all of the other structures of the lungs. <clears throat> Essentially what this is, is part of our systemic circulation. So it is a part of our systemic circulation. What that means, and let me change colors for this, I don't want to use red, uh, so we'll use green. What this means is that this is blood that comes out of the left ventricle. And the left ventricle is going to come out into the ascending aorta, uh, and it is going to come out to the aortic arch, and it is going to go to the thoracic uh, aorta. From there, It is going to go to the lungs, but here in the lungs here, we ha are going to engage in an internal gas exchange. What this means is that our O2 is going to go out of the blood and our CO2 is going to go into the blood. And again, whereas our pulmonary circulation goes to the alveoli, our bronchial circulation goes to everything else. Now, normally we would then have, so these are, let's so come back here. These are our bronchial arteries. Uh, that are leading to going to the lungs. And again, being systemic, they are O2 rich and CO2 poor because they're systemic. Normally, we would then have the bronchial veins coming back and we would expect them to eventually lead back into like the uh, superior vena cava or something along those lines. However, what is unique about this bronchial uh, circulation is that the bronchial veins actually feed into the pulmonary veins. So our bronchial veins don't actually make it back to the heart on the own. Instead, our bronchial feed into the pulmonary. Into the pulmonary veins. And of course, being systemic veins, they are O2 poor and CO2 rich. We see the effect of this. Let me squeeze that a little bit more so I can fit that into the space there. What that means is that when the blood gets back, and let's go ahead and switch to red here. When our blood returns, our blood returning to the left atrium is slightly less oxygen rich than when gas exchange took place. And we will actually see this when we get a chance to play with the numbers. All right, let's take a look at this now with the pretty pictures. So let me go ahead and share back to our uh, PowerPoint presentation. And with this PowerPoint presentation, uh, we see again, there are two circulations, our pulmonary and our bronchial. 
our pulmonary arteries, again, as we talked about, come out of our left atrium, pardon me, come out of our uh, right ventricle, uh, go into the lungs where our gas exchange takes place. It starts out oxygen poor and CO2 rich. Gas exchange takes place. And then in the pulmonary capillary, where we have that external gas exchange. And then our pulmonary veins collect that now oxygen rich CO2 poor blood and bring it back to the left atrium. And again, now that oxygen rich blood can now be distributed throughout the body. A bronchial arteries, on the other hand, their job is a part of the systemic blood supply. Their job is to feed all of the smooth muscle, all the connective tissues, all the bronchioles, and all the things that are associated with that, uh, but not every, basically everything but the alveoli. The alveoli are simple squamous epithelial tissues. They're able to get the oxygen and the nutrients that they need from the blood that's going there, from the things that are coming from the lung. But everything else uh, needs its own diffusion. Think about it, it's not that dissimilar from when we talked about the heart. The heart obviously is pumping all this blood and has massive amount of blood inside of it, but it is a large enough structure that it can't get all the oxygen and the nutrients it needs just from the blood inside of it. So if you remember, our heart has its own uh, circulation to it. In fact, if you remember, it's the first thing that gets blood, right? We have those uh, coronary arteries coming off of the ascending aorta. So the first thing that actually gets uh, oxygen-rich blood is the heart itself. It's the same thing here. Our lungs, yes, obviously is dealing with oxygen, uh, but it can't get everything that it needs by diffusion, so it needs that blood supply coming to it. All right, so again, it's going to come off of the thoracic aorta, enters into the lungs through the root, located in the hilum. And again, its job is to supply all the lung tissue except the alveoli. So if you think in those terms, uh, it's again an internal gas exchange that is taking place. However, instead of going directly back to the right atrium, like all the other systemic veins, it feeds into the pulmonary veins. Now I appreciate I did not do a very good job of uh, drawing this, but your book does have a very nice picture. Oh, wait, hold on. Uh, that, a nice picture that talks about this process in our gas exchange. So hold on a second. Let me. Ah, which we're going to talk about later. So, okay, we got to talk about that when we get to our gas exchange. So we will come back to that. But those are two circulations. All right. Oops. Excellent. All right. Any questions on that? All right. Excellent. And again, I apologize for the, uh, I'm not sure why the iPad is not working. Hopefully we'll get that ironed out and I'll play with it during the first break and see if we can figure that out. All right. With that, we are done with the anatomy. And so now we can finally get on to the physiological processes that we want to talk about. As we said, when we talked about our uh, respiration process, the first thing we need to talk about is our pulmonary ventilation. Again, this is the first thing we mean, we think of the breathing in and out process uh, that is caused by the contraction of muscles. Again, our goal is to move air in and out of the alveoli through the conducting zones, allowing it to that air to be processed. And that process is called inhalation and exhalation, or is also known as inspiration and expiration. This is gonna use skeletal muscles. Now, of course, what is the primary muscle that is used for your normal resting breath as you're doing right here now? Diaphragm. Yeah, absolutely. The diaphragm is the primary muscle. When you are sitting here uh, in your chair listening to this lecture, uh, just doing your normal resting breathing, it is the diaphragm that is primarily responsible. But as we also learned in 430, there are a lot of accessory muscles that can help in this process as well. So again, if we start thinking of this, obviously the diaphragm is the primary muscle. All right, what are some of the other ones? 
Intercostals. Excellent. So both the external and internal intercostals. All right now, although we should actually, now that I've written this out, we should think of this in terms of, uh, let's go back here and think of in terms of when they are active, when they're actually contracting, uh, are they involved in inhalation or exhalation? So let's actually get rid of this. Um, perfect. So uh, we have two processes. We have inhalation and we have exhalation. Now we say that our diaphragm is the primary muscle that is involved in our normal resting breathing, but uh, when a muscle is active, it's when it's using ATP. And when our diaphragm actively uses ATP and it contracts, what happens to the diaphragm? Diaphragm flattens out. Yeah, it gets shorter and it flattens out, absolutely. And does that allow us to inhale or does that allow us to exhale? Inhale. Inhale, inhale absolutely. So again, if we think of it in terms of when it's active, uh, the diaphragm, is involved in inhalation. We mentioned the internal and external intercostals. Uh, the internal intercostal, is that involved in exhalation or inhalation when it contracts? Exhalation. So our internal intercostal is going to be involved in exhalation and our external intercostal Uh, is involved in inhalation, right? It'd be really great if I for internal, I for inhalation, X for external, X for exhalation was the case, but as we learned in 430, that's not the case. <laughs> what are some of the other muscles that are involved in this process or can be involved in this process? Serratus anterior. Serratus anterior, excellent. And do we use that for inhalation or exhalation? Inhalation. Excellent, so our serratus anterior, excellent. Give me another one. Sternoclinomastoid. Inhalation or exhalation? Inhalation. Inhalation. Excellent. So, uh, sternoclinomastoid, we'll just abbreviate that. Mastoid. Excellent. What else? I can think of. Pectoralis minor. I'm sorry? Pectoralis minor. Pectoralis minor. Inhalation or exhalation? Inhalation. Inhalation. Yeah. Excellent. What about exhalation? Is the internal intercostal the only one that helps us to exhale? Abdominals. There you go. All of the abdominals. We'll cheat and write that there. So that means the rectus abdominis. That means the uh, uh, transversus uh, abdominis, the oblique and external and internal obliques, all of that. And there's one other muscle that helps us with exhalation. Anybody know what it is? Oh, wait, actually we have it on here. We just have it in the wrong spot. Sorry, I was so busy typing. Serratus anterior. The serratus anterior, actually, if you think about it, the way it wraps around from the uh, scapula to the front, when it contracts, it actually compresses uh, the, um, the, the uh, thoracic cavity and so plays a role in exhalation. So there you go. Those, I think, are all... Oh, wait, there is one more, though. So one more involved in inhalation. Is it the scalenes? Scalenes, excellent. Perfect, excellent, so there you go. So there are the muscles that are involved in this process. And now that I've written them all out, I think I actually have the pretty picture uh, that actually shows this. And so uh, let me go back a second so we can see our list. So again, notice there's primarily the diaphragm, uh, but then there's also these other muscles, the external intercostals, the scalenes, the sternocleidomastoid, and the pectoralis minor that all play a role that when they contract, they help to give us an exaggerated inhalation. And then we have that internal intercostal, all of the abdominal muscles in the serratus anterior that give us that exaggerated exhalation. And so if we clear all of those now, then we can see 
uh, the pretty picture showing all of those muscles, with the exception of the abdominals. Notice the abdominals are not here, but all the other muscles are here uh, showing how they relate to the thoracic cavity. Excellent. One of the things that we've talked about since the very beginning of 430 is that pressure is what makes the world go round. And in this case, the way we change the pressure is that we change the volume. This is a concept we've talked about a lot in this class. We've talked about it a lot in 430. The one thing we haven't really talked about is giving it a name. Obviously, this relationship between volume and pressure is an important uh, uh, physics concept. And in fact, that physics concept is what is known as Boyle's Law. Technically, Boyle's Law uh, is uh, that, and I think I have it written out right here. There we go. Boyle's Law basically is what we've been talking about since the very beginning of 430, that there is a relationship between uh, the volume of a gas and the pressure of that gas. So basically the way Boyle's actually came up with this law, and let's go ahead and fill in the highlight, is the pressure uh, of a gas in a particular volume is always going to be equal to uh, the pressure of that gas uh, in a second volume. Right, so they're always going to be related to each other. However, a much simpler way to write this and understand this is that the pressure is always going to be equal to the inverse of the volume. Basically, what that means is if the volume doubles, what happens to the pressure? It halves? Yeah, it goes in half. Right, so if the volume goes in uh, uh, doubles, then our pressure goes in half. If we decrease our volume by a third, what's going to happen to our pressure? Triple. Yeah, it's going to triple, absolutely. So again, the Boyle wrote it really big and fancy. The pressure of a gas in one volume is always going to be equal to the pressure of the volume in a second um, a volume. But basically what this goes down to is that pressure and volume are inversely proportional. And again, this is something we have talked about uh, since the beginning of 430, right? We keep always using the example of I blindfold you, again, assuming we were all in the classroom together, I blindfold you guys and let you walk around the classroom and eventually you'll bounce into the walls. And I count the number of times you guys bounce into the walls and that is the pressure for the size room we're in. If I put you guys into a smaller room, Right now, there's going to be more of you bouncing into the moors more frequently, and so volume goes up. And conversely, if I let you roam campus, then you're going to bump into the walls a lot less. So again, as volume goes up, pressure goes down. As volume goes down, pressure goes up. This isn't a new concept for us. This is something we've been talking about for a semester and a half now. Uh, so we're just giving it a fancy name now, and we're referring to it as Boyle's Law. So again, just we understand that good old Bob Boyle is the one who first described this, and so they named the law after him. All right. Why this is significant for us here is because it is those pressure changes that are going to move the air. Oh, this is going to be a pain. Um, well, let me see if I can get it to share my iPad now. No. Um, all right, this is not going to be fun. Okay, so when we talk about the pulmonary ventilation, as I said, there are going to be factors that influence the movement of air. Obviously, the first one is Boyle's Law. We are going to actively contract muscles. We are going to use ATP to change the volume of um, our environment, when we change the volume, we change the pressure. So again, it's that contraction and relaxation of the muscles, delta muscles, that cause the movement of the air. However, what we are really moving is the thoracic cavity, right? These muscles are all moving the ribs. They are changing the bony thorax. As we talked about, there isn't skeletal muscle within the lungs. So when we have our thoracic cavity that moves and swings outward, we want the lungs to go along with it. 
And the way we do that, as we mentioned, is by having surface tension between the visceral and the parietal pleura. The visceral and parietal pleura, remember, have that transudate, that thin layer of serous fluid. And as we talked about, that fluid has surface tension in it, thanks to the water that is in it, so that they want to stay stuck together. So that when our thoracic cavity expands, our lungs expand with it. So when our diaphragm contracts, our thoracic cavity increases, our lungs go along with it, and air comes in. When our thoracic cavity, uh, pardon me, when our diaphragm relaxes, our thoracic cavity goes back to its original position. And it does that because of the elasticity of the muscles. And the lungs go back to their original position as well because of the elasticity, or really what we call the compliance of the lungs. Right? As we have a rubber band and stretch it out, it then goes back to its original position. And that's the compliance or the elasticity of it. So that's the ability of it to basically recoil back to its original shape. These are one of the problems that as we age, just like that rubber band, as I stretch it out the first five times, it goes back to its original position without any problems at all. But after the 10,000th or the 1 millionth time, it starts to lose some of the elasticity. Uh, the uh, flexibility of our thoracic cavity, the ability of the, the ribs to swing up and down, the compliance of those uh, gets affected by scar tissue, wear and tear, a loss of ligament elasticity as we age. It gets to the point where your normal resting breath, where you use the muscles to inhale and then basically allow everything to bounce back to its original position to exhale, stops working. So one of the things that happens as we get more elderly is that uh, older people now have to use those accessory muscles we talked about to contract the thoracic cavity to exhale as well. So if you think about it, essentially as you age, you almost have to start doubling the ATP you're using for breathing. Because whereas before, inhalation is an active process and exhalation is passive. Now both inhalation and exhalation becomes active, and just the mere act of sitting there breathing can be exhausting for grandpa while he's sitting there doing that because of that loss of elasticity and loss of flexibility of the thoracic cavity. Lastly, remember while we said that surface tension between the visceral and parietal pleuras of the lungs is vitally important. It's also vitally important to not have surface tension inside of the alveoli. There, we don't want the two walls collapsing and attaching to each other. So remember, in our alveoli, we have those type 2 uh, pneumocytes uh, that produce the surficant, those septal cells that produce the surficant that is going to break up the surface tension inside the alveoli. So while the surface tension is good outside the lungs, it is bad inside the lungs. And again, one of the things that happens with age is we decrease the amount of surficant that is produced. So not only can we have a harder time bringing our thoracic cavity to the volume that it was before, but we're also, even if we get it to that cavity, uh, to that size, we're not able to get as much air in because more of the alveoli have collapsed. Typically meaning we have to see an increase in respiration rate because breathing becomes less efficient. All right, to understand how this works, we need to understand pressures because it is pressure changes that are gonna move the air. And the reason this occurs is because of the pressures that surround us in the environment that we are in. The first pressure is our atmospheric pressure. Atmospheric pressure, which is pressure to the, where's my annotation? There it is, oops. Uh, pressure ATM is the pressure exerted from the air that surrounds us. Atmospheric pressure, <clears throat> it is thought of as one atmosphere, which again is a, a perfectly acceptable number, but it isn't necessarily meaningful to us. Uh, what's much more meaningful for us and when we're doing these calculations to understand it is this here, the 760 millimeters of mercury. Right here at sea level, which I'm assuming most of us are close to, and if we were in the classroom, we would all be at, like a Sacramento is close to sea level. The pressure of the air around us is 760 millimeters of mercury. Of course, as we know, if you go up to Tahoe for the weekend, right, or you've got a cabin up there that you're hiding out uh, for the coronavirus from, 
uh, what happens to the air pressure as we go up in elevation? Increases. Decreases. Yeah, decreases, absolutely. So it's going to decrease. Where's my... There they are. Um, yeah, it is going to decrease. But here, it's about 760 millimeters of mercury. And we use that as our, as our stable point. Any pressure that is below 760 millimeters of mercury is considered to be a negative uh, respiratory pressure. Anything that is above uh, 760 millimeters of mercury is considered a positive respiratory pressure. So not only is I have atmospheric pressure our starting point is it and it's going to drive the movement of air into and out of our lungs, but we use it as our starting point so that anything below that is considered negative, anything above that is considered positive. The atmospheric pressure is our starting point, but here as we look at our lungs, so again out here is where our atmospheric pressure of 760 millimeters of mercury is located. But there are two other important pressures that we need to be aware of as well, as well as being able to calculate the relationship between them. The first pressure is the intrapulmonary pressure. The intrapulmonary pressure is the pressure that is found here inside of the alveoli. All right. Now, uh, this pressure is constantly changing. And there are two keys. I'm going to, I think it's going to come up anyway, but I'm going to go ahead and write it here. Uh, I want that away from my way there. Perfect. I'm going to go ahead and write this here to emphasize these two points. Our intrapulmonary pressure will sometimes be positive and sometimes be negative. What that means, uh, is that sometimes it'll be above 760 millimeters of mercury, and sometimes it'll be below 760 millimeters of mercury. So our intrapulmonary pressure is constantly changing. However, it may go positive or go negative, but it will always equalize to atmospheric pressure uh, to P18. So it is always going to equalize to atmospheric pressure. So it may go down, but it's gonna come back up. It may go up, but it's always gonna come back down. So it will be positive and negative, and this ability to make it positive and negative is going to be what moves air in and out of the lungs. But it's always going to equalize to atmospheric pressure. All right, so let's clear that. The second pressure is our intrapleural pressure. Intrapleural pressure is the pressure in that space between our visceral pleura and our parietal pleura. So it's in the pleural cavity. So again, let's emphasize this. This is the pressure in the space between the parietal and visceral pleura. Oops. Pleura. So in that little bit of space where that transudate is. Remember in here we have that surface tension that is hoping to hold and keep those two layers close to each other. But the other important thing about this intrapleural pressure is twofold. Again, there are two important rules on this. First is that it must always be a negative pressure. It must always be lower than atmospheric pressure. So again, that's what it means. And it must always be less than the pressure inside the pleural. So the intra, uh, pulmonary, sorry, pressure. If one of those two things don't occur, if suddenly the pressure here inside of this space becomes equal to outside uh, pressure, 
or if it becomes equal to the pressure inside of the lungs, what would happen to our lungs in that case? It would collapse the lung. Yeah, it would collapse the lung, absolutely. We would not be able to inflate the lung anymore if that was the case. So this has always got to be the case with our intrapleural pressure. It has to always be a negative pressure, and because our intrapulmonary can sometimes be negative, it also has to always be less than our intrapulmonary pressure as well. All right, so let's clear that. Come back here and do that. Obviously, if we have these two pressures, then we need to be able to relate them to each other. So that's gonna be the difference between them. Uh, here in this case, as we can see, our pressure inside of our lungs right now is equal to the outside, so it's 760. Uh, this always needs to be negative and always needs to be less, so notice right now it is 756. So notice we take one, we subtract the other, we can see that that is going to be a number, and that's just our transpulmonary pressure. So our transpulmonary pressure is basically just the difference between the intrapulmonary and the intrapleural, and really the point of this is to emphasize that uh, they cannot be equal. There always has to be a transpulmonary pressure. If the transpulmonary pressure equals zero, if the pressure inside the lungs and outside the lungs in the thoracic cavity became equal, the lung would collapse, and more, and we, which basically means we would not be able to inflate it. So that's really what the key. That keeps the airway open, because if there's no transpulmonary pressure, if the two are equal to each other, if the transpulmonary pressure is zero, then the lung cannot be inflated. And we say that that lung has collapsed. All right, everybody with me so far? Give me a yes or a thumbs up or something like that to make sure this makes sense because it's about to get worse. So let's make sure we understand these values before we can talk about how they're gonna change uh, during the mechanical events that we talk about as respiration. Excellent, looks like most people get this. All right, perfect. So let us move forward then. So, as I mentioned, these two pressures are going to change during uh, the respiration cycle. Again, we have our uh, inhalation, we have our exhalation. Okay, uh, we have our inhalation and we have our exhalation, and these values are going to fluctuate during that time. As I said, the intrapulmonary pressure will sometimes become positive, sometimes become negative, but it's always going to equalize to the atmospheric pressure. And like I said, the uh, intrapleural pressure is always going to be less than both the pulmonary and atmospheric. So it always has to be negative, but it also has to be less than the intrapulmonary pressure. And we did that. All right. Uh, normally, this is the point where I would draw this process, but again, because I can't seem, and I guess I'll try it one more time, just in hopes that somehow miraculously it's going to now allow me to do this. Nope, will not allow me to do that. All right, so rather than me trying to do a horrible job of drawing this on the whiteboard that I have here, we will use the pretty illustration from your textbook. Uh, to make sure that this is making sense and we can talk about what is going on in here. All right, so this is our graph. Now let's take make sure we understand what is going on in this graph. Again, here is our zero point and if you think about our zero point and we'll cheat and put the number over here to remind us, is our 600, uh, 760 millimeters of mercury. This is our atmospheric pressure. So actually we'll stick it over here so it's out of the way. That is our atmospheric pressure. Uh, that is our starting point. So again, as we've talked about, uh, pressures that are above that are positive pressures, pressures that are below that are negative pressures. Here is our starting point at the beginning of our respiration. So again, as we can see right here at this starting point, uh, right here, at this point right here, this is before we start taking our first inhalation. So again, there's no movement of air going on. Then if you notice, there are two things that start to happen. 
the first thing that starts to happen, and we'll put another arrow right here to talk about what is happening here, is that when we start our inhalation, and again, we'll assume a normal uh, resting uh, breath, basically what happens during the inspiration is our diaphragm contracts. Put that there so that we can keep it on this side. As we know, and let's change this to black so we can make more sense, when this occurs, our volume is going to increase. And our, here I'll cheat and do it this way, pressure. So let's do that and then I can do that, and then I can do that. When our thoracic cavity uh, diaphragm contracts, our volume of our thoracic cavity increases, and of course, as we see, the pressure decreases. So that's what we're seeing that's occurring right here in this period of time. Notice that the pressure is going down. Our volume is increasing and our pressure is going down because our thoracic cavity is expanding. Notice the same thing is happening down here as well. At the same time here in the space between, because our thoracic cavity is moving outward as it's pulling away from the lungs, there's a little bit more space there in the lungs. And so the pressure is going to go down here as well. So we see that exact same thing happening. Uh, so again, here we have our volume and our pressure. Let me move this over here a little bit more. Excellent. Actually, I want to move this to move that to here. And then, oh, come on. There we go. Volume increase, pressure decreases. Excellent. And we see the same thing here. Our volume is increasing and our pressure is decreasing. All right. You guys with me so far? Thumbs up, say yes is something. Yes. Excellent, perfect. All right. Now, the one thing you have to remember is up here, this is our intrapulmonary pressure. And remember, our, our pulmonary pressure is open to the outside world. So out here, again, remember there is air at 760 millimeters of mercury in the outside world surrounding us. And so when the, vol pardon me, when the volume increases in our lungs and the pressure goes down, there is now a pressure gradient between the air in the outside world and inside our lungs. And so the same way that uh, things move down a concentration gradient, air moves down a pressure gradient. And that is what is happening right here. What we see going on right here is that our diaphragm is continuing to contract and our volume is continuing to go up and our pressure is continuing to go down. However, what is special and why we see this change here is now that there is a pressure gradient, what happens is air enters the lungs. Oops, uh oh. That. There we go. There we go. So right here in this part, uh, let's select that and make it smaller. Air is entering the lungs. When air enters the lungs, again, remember pressure is the number of times that you guys in the classroom are bouncing against the walls. If I open the door and let 10 more people come inside, right? then what's going to happen to the number of times people are bouncing against the walls? It's going to increase. increase. It's going to increase, and that's what's going to happen. So even though the volume is getting bigger, at this point, air is now coming in. And because we're adding more air, our pressure goes back up. So as a result of this, the pressure is going to increase. 
and air is going to keep coming in until ultimately at this point right here where now the pressure inside the lungs and the pressure inside uh, the i mean outside in the world are now equal and so at this point right here right, the pressure now equalizes again because the pressure in the atmosphere and the pressure in the lungs st stop. And again, this isn't a new concept to you, right? If you were to try to take, and again, we're talking about this in terms of a resting breath, but even if you were trying to take an exaggerated inhalation, can you continue to inhale forever and just keep on inhaling and keep on inhaling and air just keeps coming in and in and in? No. You can only get your thoracic cavity so big and the bigger you get, obviously, the lower the pressure, the more air that's going to come inside. But as more and more air comes inside, then basically we reach that point, that magical point that we always talk about. And that magical point is, of course, equilibrium. Where now the pressure inside the lungs and the pressure inside the out or outside in the world are equal and no more air moves. All right, with me so far with that? Yep. Excellent. All right, now notice, that's what's happening inside the lungs. But look what's happening in our intrapleural space. Again, as we saw, the volume is increasing and the pressure is going down. And that was true here. Notice the pressure started to change inside the lungs because air could come inside. But is there any air that is going to get into the space here in, in, in between our lungs and our thoracic cavity? Should there be any air in there? No. No. If there's no air in there, there's nothing that is going to increase the pressure. So the pressure just goes down and it stays down. Right? Because there's no change in the air volume. in the amount of air in the pleural cavity. So the pressure stays down. All right, that's the big difference between what's happening in the intrapleural uh, uh, space and the intrapulmonary. In the intrapleural, there is no movement of air. So the pressure goes down and the pressure stays down. Whereas in the intrapulmonary inside the lungs, so let's put this on this side over here, air comes in. And in fact, that's what our illustration here shows us down here. Notice volume goes up, pressure goes down, and air comes in. And air continues to come in until now the pressure inside the lungs is equal to the pressure in the outside world, and our inhalation stops. All right, so here we see the movement of air caused by the pressure changes that are occurring in both the intrapulmonary space and the intrapleural space. Questions on any of that? All right, excellent. So then the expiration is basically, as you can see, the opposite of this. This is going to be when our diaphragm uh, is going to relax. When our diaphragm relaxes, I wish I can cut and paste these things. There might be a way to do that, but I don't know what it is. Our volume and our pressure are going to change. In this case, when our diaphragm relaxes, we have that recoil and our volume is going to, oops, let's, well, I guess we can go ahead and use blue, I don't care. Our volume is going to go down. And of course, what happens to our pressure? Increases. Pressure is going to go up. Now, same thing is happening here in our uh, intrapleural space. Again, our volume is decreasing and our pressure, I'll cheat and put this down here. 
our volume is decreasing, so our pressure is increasing. And notice it does that the whole way, because again, there's gonna be no change in the movement of air there. However, when this pressure goes up here, now we again have a pressure gradient, and that pressure gradient is going to move air out of the lungs. Well, the air is not gonna to want to be at a place of a high pressure, and so it's gonna move out of the lungs. And as that air moves out of the lungs, there are less people to bounce into the walls. So of course, what happens, oh, let's not put that there. What happens to the pressure inside of our lungs as that air leaves? That pressure is going to go down. Yeah, this pressure is gonna go down. And it's gonna to continue to go down until once again, it reaches that state of equilibrium. 760 millimeters verde, uh, 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 mercury, in which case air stops exiting your lungs. And again, if you think about this, if you try to do a forced exhalation, try to force as much air out of your lungs as possible, can you, do you keep breathing out until there's no more air left in your lungs? Is anyone no. able to completely empty their lungs? No. No, of course not. Instead, you keep forcing air out until the pressure of the air that remains in your lungs is equal to the pressure of the air outside, at which point you stop breathing air out. You can't get any more air out. So you can't empty your lungs. Instead, you're just equalizing the pressure. I know this graph is a little intimidating when you look at it, but if you really pay attention, as we talked about, it shows everything that we just talked about. As we just mentioned, notice our intrapulmonary pressure will sometimes be negative and sometimes be positive, but it is always going to equalize to atmospheric pressure. So we drop the pressure, it becomes negative, air comes in and it equalizes. We increase the pressure, and air goes out until it equalizes. And notice it's the contraction and relaxation of the muscles that change these volumes, which change these pressures. These contractions and relaxations of the muscles also change the pressures of our intrapleural space. We increase the volume and pressure drops. We decrease the volume and pressure goes up. But we don't see that change in the curve because air does not move in and out of the intrapleural space. This intrapleural space uh, should not have air in it and air doesn't move into and out of it. So when we increase the volume, the pressure drops. And then when we decrease the volume, pressure goes up. And that's the only change that takes place. And these contractions, these changes of pressure cause the air to come in and the air to go out. And the last thing that I'll say about that, if you notice how much air, as you're sitting here at rest, uh, your normal resting tidal breath is about half a liter of air coming into and coming out of your lungs. All right, questions on that? All right, excellent. Uh, this is a good stopping point. Let's go ahead and take a 10 minute break. Uh, during this 10 minute break, I'm gonna close down my Zoom. So I'm gonna stop this recording. And so we'll have this recording in two points. I'm gonna close down my uh, Zoom and come back in. And hopefully at that point, I will be able to use the iPad again. So I'm not sure why I'm not able to do that. Uh, so I am gonna, uh, I will close the room. I don't know if that's gonna kick everybody out, uh, but then you should be able to add right back in. So I'm gonna stop the recording. I will come back at uh, 9, 10. Well, actually, I'm going to come right, right back. But we'll start the lecture up back again at 9, 10. All right, so any questions before we do that? All right, I'm going to stop the recording. I'm going to close, the, I'm going to close my Zoom and see if I can get this to work. So.